All right, great. So um, I, I really enjoyed all the talks today. The um, It's kind of a, a little union of all things that are very exciting and interesting to me, including the, the role in palliative care and then also the molecular studies that are coming out with um, with everything. And to, to add to, to that, I wanted to briefly discuss um, meningiomas because I feel like this is sort of an underappreciated tumor that in recent years has come to the forefront of a lot of molecular uh, advances. And I also wanted to do a brief review um, of an update regarding these uh, meningioma classifications. Um, so, so very briefly, these are tumors that arise um, from the arachnoid cap cells of the meninges. Uh, and because the brain and spinal cord are just surrounded by, by the, the meninges, meningiomas can arise anywhere along the central nervous system. These tumors grow outside of the brain. Um, they usually present by um, whatever symptoms they cause due to compression of the nearby brain tissues. And because of the variability in the location as well as the eloquent brain areas that might be adjacent to the tumors, the presenting symptoms can be incredibly variable. Um, and of course, as uh, imaging techniques uh, and as patient lifespan has uh, increased, the incidence of identifying these tumors has actually increased. And so a little bit of history. Um, meningiomas actually weren't always considered a benign path pathology. Um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, hyperostatic and outward physical changes were actually what led to the diagnosis of meningiomas. Um, Early attempts at surgical resection of these tumors generally presented with incredibly high mortality. Uh, Victor Horsley had endorsed a 46% mortality rate in the early 1900s. Um, and of course, as many advances in uh, medicine back in the day uh, sort of changed the landscape for, for these tumors. So um, Harvey Cushing had deeply studied these meningiomas and um, had put out a, a case series of um, about 300 patients between 1902 and 1932 to document his experience of these tumors, and thankfully uh, was able to get the mortality rate down to less than 10%. Um, I think what, what's really you know, meaningful is that back then, he said, there, there is today nothing in the whole realm of surgery more gratifying than the successful removal of a meningioma with subsequent perfect functional recovery. And I think that still kind of stands true today, too. Um, and of course, thankfully, in the modern era, we're not faced with the same high mortality, um, but there are other challenges that come with meningiomas instead. And so these are the most common primary CNS tumors. There's an incidence of about 9 per 100,000. Um, in the population. It's more prevalent in, in women um, than it is in men, and noticeably after the fifth decade of life. And so in this red box, you can see that this blue uh, color of the pie chart, it's about 37% of CNS tumors. And there's a small wedge adjacent to that that is about 0.4% of the, them um, of all CNS tumors that have been deemed malignant. And so, um, of course, due to their variability in location, the presentation of these tumors can, can be very different. And so, historically, these have been graded um, from one to three. Uh, and the WHO grading landscape has mostly been with um, a histopathologic analysis of these tumors. Um, these are the descriptive findings based on what they see under the microscope. And, you know, this has been sort of the, the standard way that, that meningiomas have been assessed. And you can see on the right that uh, the recurrence rate for what was deemed grade one is about anywhere from 7 to 25 percent. Grade twos are 29 to 52 percent. And then grade threes, um, anywhere from 50 to 94 percent. And these are very, very large ranges in terms of recurrence rates. So. Um, in 2016, the WHO actually released an update on meningioma classifications, and this still relied heavily on histopathologic characterizations. Um, what was interesting, though, was that in comparison, uh, glial tumors and other primary brain tumor types started to have more molecular classifications that were being integrated into the pathology. And really, it wasn't until 2021 uh, when the WHO classifications were updated, and it included two um, optional molecular criteria for meningiomas, and they were for WHO grade three tumors. So here's a, a whole list of, of the tumors that, that were updated. Meningiomas occupy this tiny little 
little uh, wedge here. And it continues to remain a single entity. But even within this entity, there's 15 different subtypes. Um, and this table here shows the molecular subtypes that are um, including the TERT promoter mutation, as well as the CDK and 2A um, and B homozygous deletions for these WHO grade three meningiomas. But, you know, despite these molecular updates, um, the WHO grading system still has a lot of limitations in terms of predicting recurrence of these tumors. So outlined in this table over here, we can see um, some gen general guidelines that, that we've been using um, for the treatments of these meningiomas. And so if you look at the top, um, there's uh, no mass effect um, on these findings on MRI, then usually patients and physicians will opt for observation. Um, let's say the tumor does have significant mass effect um, if their patient is symptomatic. And I would also add if they've had some radiographic growth over time, then after careful discussion with the patient, if they're interested in an intervention, you can see that there are options for therapeutic intervention. Um, historically, surgery has been uh, the primary means of intervention, and sometimes patients who are not in the best clinical state um, may not be the best surgical candidates. You can also opt for uh, radiation um, to be, be an option as well. And so as we continue along this algorithm, um, when you do your surgery, there are different grades um, in terms of the, the extent of resection. And then sometimes this can also help guide um, the, the patient as well as the clinician and surgeon um, about what the next steps would be. And so, of course, um, I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with the Simpson grading, which is the extent of the resection of the tumor. That, in addition to the histopathologic grading of the tumor, you can opt for observation, more treatment, um, or um, experimental therapy if there is something that is um, readily available uh, as an option. And so as we, we've been learning more and more about these meningiomas, we've seen that with the inclusion of the TERT promoter mutations and the CDK and 2A um, uh, genetic changes, um, we've also seen an increased interest in just general meningioma gen genomics. So basically, in maybe like the last 10, 15 years, um, there's been a, a, a huge um, boom in the genetic profiling of, of meningiomas. And this has also included methylation profiles, which has included um, identified six methylation subtypes. Um, so in this paper that came out in 2013, you can see that there's a variety of driver mutations that are associated with anatomic location of these tumors along the skull base. And then as they continue to study at a more molecular level, a lot of nuanced features of these tumors began to emerge. So when you better understand the molecular subtypes, then you can also have um, a better prediction in terms of the recurrence rate for these tumors. So in patients that have had um, hedgehog mutations, NF2 mutations, TRAF7 mutations, um, and even the, the PI3K mutations, they have nearly a 27-fold increase in recurrence rates compared to other tumors that have the KLF4, polar, or SMARC-B1 mutated meningiomas. And these are studies that have been going on for, you know, over 50 months. So you know, in addition to these genetic um, molecular changes, you can also consider copy number variations and, again, methylation profilings, as well as um, looking at somatic mutations within uh, which each patient. Um, additionally, there have been imaging studies that have come out. Um, so patients have been um, looking at, or radiologists, actually, with dotatate PET scans. And so this is a scan that looks at the somatostatin receptor ligands that are generally found on these meningiomas. And this can help with tumor diagnosis, as well as delineating where the tumor margins are. So with the C-IMPACT Now Update 8, um, this was a, a publication that came out pretty recently. Um, it clarifies a lot of the, the pathology um, and the histopathology, and then also for, for tumors that are sort of in between in terms of their molecular classification, it helps put them into a bucket that'll, you know, guide what we can, we as surgeons and, um, you know, neuro-oncologists and, and medical teams can um, do for our, for our patients. Um, this is the 
flow sheet that now includes a CDK N2A, um, an N2B homozygous deletion, as well as a TERP promoter oncogenic variant. Um, and then that'll shuttle these tumors to be CNS uh, WHO grade three tumors. And then when we look at the, the next part of this, um, these these tumors that might have borderline findings that are soft calls for either grade one or grade two, molecular testing can really be helpful to further guide the histologic findings that we see. So then if you have a lower grade molecular profile, um, then you can bucket it into a WHO grade tumor versus if you have high risk features like a 1P or 22Q loss or any other major chromosomal abnormalities, or if they have a higher risk uh, methylation profile, these you know, previously thought to be reasonably benign tumors can now be pushed over to the grade two um, bucket. Uh, from a histopathologic standpoint, they've clarified a lot of um, the, the findings in terms of defining mitotic activity. Um, so we really need to make sure that the slides are good quality slides. And then the updated features are, instead of being anywhere from four to 19 mitoses per high powered field for grade two, and over 20 mitoses um, per high powered field in grade three tumors, they've actually created um, uh, a, an area so that you can find um, you know, a certain number of mitoses. In terms of brain invasion, they clarified that the brain invasion should be truly infiltration of the tumor through the leptomeninges rather than just kind of coursing along the Verkel robin spaces. And then for this study, um, really the tumor sampling is critical for this assessment, right? If you get a sample from the core of the tumor, you're not really going to be able to see whether or not the brain invasion is truly there. But if you get it from the periphery of the tumor, then of course the likelihood of finding true brain invasion is, is much easier. Um, and then they've also added this brain invasive meningioma, otherwise benign um, type of category, which um, I personally think I need to study on a little bit more as well. So, you know, with all these things that are changing and, and updates in the molecular features of meningiomas, there's, there's sort of a, a new evolving landscape of them. And so what was initially, you know, back in the, back in the day was thought to be a really terrible and high mortality disease, um, the, the landscape has transformed into something that is more treatable. Um, and you see papers that are being published that have these really complicated molecular aspects to them that's integrating um, like the methylation profile, the proteomics, the genomics, the RNA sequencing, and everything. And then, you know, they're, they're looking at survival. So, you know, when you, when you take everything into account, all these things can really help to guide what we do in terms of extent of resection, um, guiding the patient and having the discussions about future treatments for the patient as well. So looking to the future, you know, once we, we sort of, you know, have our current methodologies right now, we look at the histology, the proliferative index, and the brain invasion, and then we started to slowly incorporate some of that geno genetic data, and then also with our known extent of resection, we can start to look at what's evolving and emerging in terms of the technologies that we're using to better characterize and define these, these tumors. So by looking at you know, the full whole exome sequencing, looking at chromosomal abnormalities, incorporating methylation profiling, we can start to build, for the future at least, you know, an integrated molecular and methylomic classification. And then hopefully if we find targetable treatment, um, targetable um, mutations, then we can actually maybe start to integrate some sort of you know, chemotherapeutic agent or something that, that's a little bit more targetable. And ultimately, I think that by integrating everything that we know about meningiomas, we can start to have more prognostic um, and predictive algorithms that, de that develop from all these different studies. So it's still a, a tumor that is um, revealing itself to us. And I think that over the years, as our own sequencing um, and analytical methods start to advance, then we'll be able to help guide patients a little bit better. Because meningiomas, they're, they're the type of tumor that will come back. And even if it's a grade one, even grade one tumors can still be pretty devastating for patients. So being able to understand them better and then understand the patient, I think that we can do a really great job of, of helping to guide these patients in their treatments. And so with that,
Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thanks. Um, I had a question looking at the CMPEC Now 8 guidelines. One thing that I kind of wish they would be a little bit more clear about is which molecular testing in which moment, um, especially when you know we reference methylation profiling, but that's difficult to access. Um, one specific question I have is, is when do you think fish should be obtained, which might then trigger NGS? Um, that's a good question. I, I feel like with the way that, um, that sequencing platforms are advancing, you know, fish just might be mm. out of the question and, you know, you can just send it for sequencing anyways. Um, you know, we've been hearing all these talks about different mutations that might come up and they might be variants of unknown significance and all these different targets. So just by having that whole exome, you know, sort of like global view of the tumor, I think that would, that might be, um, we might get to a point where that just becomes, you know, a reflex pathology assessment. So yeah, I, I don't know um, what, whether or not fish really has uh, a strong you know, home in meningioma pathology just yet. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Kim. And with that, lunch is served. We'll see you back here. Uh